to come over and give us a lecture. And um, so I really respect this guy because he, he's the director of uh, uh, the automation research at University of Maryland, one of the very premier research labs with very, 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 uh, he has like publications in top conferences like CVPR, you know, these are, these are the top, uh, uh, top uh, conferences in the field of computer vision. He has done publications since like 1975, I believe, right, your earliest. Yeah, and, and he does a lot of things that's relevant to what you guys do, like object recognition, action recognition, uh, uh, and then tracking and so on. So and if you go to his Google Scholar link, oh my god, it's crazy. It's like there's citations over 10,000 or something. So, so it's, he's, he's a really incredible guy. So I'm going to let him talk more about what his uh, computer vision laboratory does. OK, so professor, please take it away. Thank right. You. Okay. Uh -huh. yeah, just put it in a pocket. And just put this right. All right. <coughs> okay. Happy to be here, man. There were a lot of you. Uh, pretty incredible. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, the computer vision lab here at the University of Maryland, <coughs> and then uh, a bit about a couple of our projects that will give me an opportunity to tell you a little bit more about deep learning than maybe you <coughs> already know. All right. <coughs> so. The uh, Computer Vision Lab is one of the oldest research laboratories at the University of Maryland. It was established over 50 years ago by a guy who was actually my advisor. Uh, his name was Azriel Rosenfeld. And, and Azriel was the founder of the field of computer vision. So he started the first journal, and he wrote the first textbook, and he started the first conference. Uh, during the course of his career, he wrote over 600 technical papers on various problems in computer vision. Back when it was started, it was called picture processing by computer. Uh, and the field went through a series of name changes, and about 25 years ago, <coughs> it uh, settled on this. Uh, uh, Oh, that's, I don't know what, that's some reminder that I'm supposed to be here or something, okay, uh, on, the, on the title Computer Vision. So today, uh, this laboratory contains six faculty from a couple of departments from ECE in computer science, uh, eight professional staff. These are like postdoctoral level people. There are 75 PhD students, which really is an astronomical amount for a single laboratory. <clears throat> and then we have a lot of specialized hardware because all the research is really about deep learning. Computer vision over the last seven to eight years has morphed into uh, like applied deep learning and uh, uh, fundamental problems in deep learning. So one of the things we have to support the research is a cluster called Vulcan that has 200 uh, GPUs on it. Uh, and 200 GPUs might sound like a lot, but the cluster is uh, generally saturated on a 24-7 basis uh, by students trying to meet various conference deadlines. Right? So it's very active. Right? <clears throat> uh, so uh, working computer vision is mostly funded by the government. And within the government, most of it is funded by various branches of the Defense Department. Right? So there's something called DARPA. How many of you have heard of DARPA? All right, fine, so I don't have to go into that too much. All right, <clears throat> so there are uh, a couple of DARPA projects. I'll talk about one of them uh, starting on the next slide. Uh, the first project is a project called SquadX, and this has to do with developing robot vision systems uh, on, that can move around in the wild and detect and track people in vehicles to provide some measure of operational security to soldiers who are occupied doing other things. Uh, and then we're involved in a program called Metaphor. <laughs> Metaphor stands for Media Forensics. Oh, that's his computer. That's not my computer making all that noise, okay? Uh, media forensics. Uh, and media forensics has to do with determining whether an image or a video has been tampered with. Have any of you uh, tried the deep fake software? Anybody? Okay, a couple of you, right? So uh, with deepfake, you can sort of put Nicolas Cage anywhere, right? If you uh, happen to be lucky enough to pick the right object, uh, object video, all right? <clears throat> and so uh, within the computer vision field, there's been the development of these things called generative adversarial networks, or GANs. I'll tell you a little bit about those on the last slide of the presentation. And these have sort of revolutionized the ability to generate uh, realistic-looking image images from scratch, uh, images that people have a generally hard time discriminating from, from real images. And this worries people uh, because <clears throat> it means that there's a lot of real fake news and fake videos and, and images that are uh, you know, promulgated over the web. All right? So I'll tell you a little bit about our research on this metaphor project. Then there's uh, the analog to DARPA in the intelligence community is something called IOPA, or the Intelligence Advanced Project Research Agency. Uh, and we have three uh, projects from this agency. One is called Core 3D. 
And so Core 3D has to do with analyzing what are called multi-pass satellite images in order to locate and build three-dimensional models of all the man-made structures on the surface of the planet. All right, we can't do that yet. That's the research project, right? So there's a collection of satellites that precess around the globe, and at any point on the globe, any, any inhabited point on the globe, once every six or seven days, one of the satellites pass over that point and generates an image. Okay? Incredibly enough, at satellite altitudes, the resolution of the image at each pixel is about half of a meter. All right? That means that that desk would be around the two, point, two by four uh, pixel thing in an image taken from space. This ought to scare you, okay? Uh, there's nothing that happens outside that isn't seen by these satellites, all right? Uh, so why in the world would uh, the intelligence community care about mapping uh, three-dimensional structures around the world? Well, consider the application, the problem of determining the world's natural gas inventories. All right, how would you do that? Well, you take aerial images or satellite images of natural gas storage facilities. They're more or less balloons. All right, and you sort of measure the height of the balloon. That tells you how much gas is there. All right, and now you know how much. Is that me? What is this? Now, you know, I'll put this on silent and see if this makes a difference. And now you know how much gas is stored in the Ukraine or any place in the world that you want to know about. And this helps you negotiate contracts for the sale of natural gas, things of this sort. Right, so Core 3D is all about deep learning, the detecting and modeling man-made structures in satellite imagery. Uh, Diva is a project on video analysis, human activity recognition in video. Uh, and then Janus is a video face recognition project. And all these things are based on, on deep learning. Right. So let's talk about a couple of these projects. All right. Let's talk about the media forensic project. So there, there are two parts to our, to our media forensic project. One has to do with being able to determine whether an image that contains one or more people has been tampered with. In particular, by looking at the people in the image, and this has got to be this thing, right? This, there's no other possibility. All right. Uh, it must be every time some piece of mail comes in, this thing is beeping at me. Uh, so looking at images of people and trying to determine which, if any, of the people in those images have been tampered with. They might have been tampered with, they might have been taken out of one image and placed in this image to give you the impression that a person was someplace where he or she actually wasn't. All right? And so we do this by both a physical and statistical analysis of the pixels in people's faces and bodies. All right? uh, but the other thing that people are beginning to do now is they're beginning to modify the metadata right, of images taken by devices like iPhones. So what metadata might they tamper with? They might tamper with the location metadata, that is where the image was taken, or the time metadata, when the picture was taken. All right? And again, they do this with an intention of deceiving somebody that a person was at a particular place and at a particular time when in fact they weren't. All right. So these are the two things we work on. So let's look at an example and let me ask you uh, for this image, which one of these images <coughs> contains a tampered face? Okay, so take a look, uh, study it carefully. Uh, and so is it the left, how many of you think the left image, this is the left image, uh, contains a tampered face? If you get this wrong, then don't bother registering for the course next semester. Okay, all right. And how many of you think the right image contains the tampered face? All right. Okay, well, the answer is it's the right image and it's that guy uh, in the right image, okay? If you got it right, it's just because you guessed, okay? Uh, <laughs> there's no way in the world that you actually saw the artifacts uh, that our deep learning algorithms see in order to determine that there's some inconsistency between uh, the two faces in, in, in the right image, okay? But, but what, where might those inconsistencies come from? Suppose that this guy, uh, he really was originally in another picture, and we lifted him and put him in there and blended him. Okay, so what kind of information might you try to get at using computer vision techniques to determine that those two faces didn't come from the same picture? Yeah. Lighting. Lighting, that's a really good answer, right? Uh, the illumination. <coughs> All right, uh, and it turns out that in computer vision there are good classical models as well as deep models for taking an image of a face and estimating the illumination on the face. Okay, which is one of the things we do. All right, uh, there, but there are other sources of information that you can use uh, to try and determine whether or not those two faces came from the same image, and they have to do with color artifacts. So, how does a color camera work? Anybody know? You have the CCD array behind the lens, and in front of each CCD element is a, is one color filter red, blue, or green. So there's some pattern of red, blue, and green pixels in the raw data taken by the camera. But when you process a color image, you have RGB at every pixel. How does that happen? 
All right, right? Well, it happened through some proprietary interpolation algorithm, filling in algorithm, that the vendors have developed in order to create RGB images, three channel images, from, from, an, from a measurement that only has one measurement per pixel. Right? And what makes this hard is the way that you fill things in near the boundaries of objects so you don't blur the image or cause bleeding of colors from one part of the image to another. And that's why these things are proprietary. But they're different from one camera manufacturer to another and even from one camera model to another. In fact, when your software gets updated on your iPhone, they could be changing the, uh, the, the, the so-called bear filter uh, the interpolation algorithm, right? And a deep model, right, can uncover those things if you give it enough data, right? Uh, another source of information is actually in the very, very low-level noise uh, in the image. So if you, take a, if you take two cameras and take a dark image, so an image in a room where there's hardly any light, uh, then you have black pixels, but in fact you don't. All right? uh, and there are going to be certain patterns to the little noise measurements that you get in this, very, in this dark field. All right? <clears throat> and you can't see them visually when you look at a picture because the, they're t you're talking about one or two gray levels in, in, in each channel and your visual system just isn't fine enough to discriminate those types of, of, of brightness, brightness differences. But again, and, and the patterns differ from one camera to another or one, <clears throat> one model to another. All right? And so you can actually go out and collect data from all different camera, camera manufacturers and train a deep model to identify the camera uh, that took a given picture or just to decide whether two faces were taken with different cameras because the noise statistics are different. Okay? <clears throat> so, and there are probably more uh, potential sources of information, right? So you can build specialized models like an illumination model to try and directly recover the illumination for those two faces, see if they're consistent. You can try and recover the coefficient, say, of a bear filter, right, uh, and then try to determine whether or not those, those faces are consistent. Or you can try to recover some statistical representation of the noise model. Or you can say, the hell with all that, okay? I'm not going to do that. Oh, oh, there's another one's going on. Oh, I see. Okay, fine. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to train a deep network to find whatever cues there might be in images, right? integrate all that information, right? uh, and try and have that deep network decide, given two faces in an image, are those faces consistent with one another for any reason. Okay? And so there are many, many ways you can do this, but one way we did it is with something called a Siamese network. Right? Did you talk about Siamese networks? Uh, okay, so you know what Siamese cats are? Okay, Siamese twins, Siamese this, Siamese that, right? So a Siamese network is a two-stream network, right? And the two streams are identical. So you put a picture into each stream, and when the network finishes its job, it's created some representation, right, of those two images, right? Maybe the features in the last convolutional layer or whatever, okay? And then you feed these representations, you bring them together, right? <clears throat> and you train a classification network, there's only two possible classes, same or different. Right? You train a classification network to decide whether or not these two images are in some sense the same or different, it's depend upon what same or different codes. Okay? So the way that we did this is we took a couple of hundred thousand images, ran a face detector, we have a very good face detector, right? face detection is more or less a solved problem. Right? Uh, we ran a face detector and we got a couple of hundred thousand images, a couple of hundred thousand faces from these couple of hundred thousand images. And then we just created this kind of virtual data set and we, had, we trained the deep network to determine whether two faces came from the same or different images. If that was the problem, right? We train the Siamese network. So we take a face from one image and a face from either the same image or a different image, right? And we train this network, right? We know what the ground truth is, whether they came from the same image or not. If the network gives the wrong answer, you backpropagate the error through the network. That is, you fiddle with all the knobs. The knobs are the weights in the network. Think of it as a 10 million knob device, okay? And you get to turn the knobs a little bit after each uh, training epic to try and get a better answer than you got last time. Right? Some networks have nearly 256 million knobs. Right? That's a lot of knobs, right? <clears throat> and that's why they can only be trained using these large-scale automatic methods. Right? So this is a so-called Siamese network. All right? And that's a blow-up of the Siamese network. It's based on something called ResNet all right, I don't know if you bother talking about ResNet in the class, not if you've only had a few lectures, right? But you'll recognize all the basic steps, right? Convolution, 
right, create some filters, right, learn the filters, uh, batch normalization that essentially just takes the data and makes it all like zero mean single standard deviation data so that it's comparable across data sets. Right, ReLU is this, is this nonlinear function. It just sort of chops the data off at zero, right, passes the rest through. All right, and then you do this a few times, and this is called a ResNet building block. Most modern uh, networks are based on these so-called ResNet blocks. All right, so that's the Siamese network. Okay, this is the standard kind of representation <coughs> for the ResNet blocks. All right. all right, so this is how computer vision people evaluate what they're doing. Okay, uh, so here's the Siamese network based on ResNet, the so-called virtual data set of these pairs of faces. They either come from the same or different images from our database. <clears throat> and so then the question is, well, how well does one model work versus another? Uh, and in this figure, what we compare is the Siamese network based on this more modern, sophisticated ResNet uh, architecture to one based on what's called VGG. Maybe you talk to them about VGG, which was one of the older, shallower networks. Okay? And the important thing here is not which one worked better, but how to read this chart. Right? So that if you look at a computer vision paper and you see a chart like this, you know what the hell it means. Okay, so what this chart is plotting is what's called a receiver operating characteristic curve. All right, uh, and on the x-axis is something called the false positive rate, and on the y-axis is something called the true positive rate. Okay, <clears throat> and there's always a trade-off between these two things. All right, suppose that you're screening some patient for some disease. Okay, uh, so the true positive rate, so people come into the office and you give them this test, take the temperature, and you say whether or not they have some terrible disease or not based on their body temperature, okay? Maybe you make a few other measurements, all right? So you'd make these measurements, now you have to make your decision, okay? You can get a true positive rate of 100% by saying that everybody has the disease, okay? Um, unfortunately, they're all going to move on to the next stage of diagnosis, which can be horribly invasive, all right? All right, so you say, well, that's not good, okay? You can have a zero false positive rate by saying nobody has the disease. Okay? And you say, well, that's not good either because then the people that really do have, a, do have the disease are just going to shrivel up and die because they're not going to get treated. So there's always a trade-off between, for any test and decision, between the true positive rate and the false positive rate. If you want to increase the true positive rate, this always, come at the, always comes at the expense of increasing the false positive rate. Right? Ideally, you'd like to operate up here with a 100% true positive rate and a zero false positive rate. This never happens on any real problem. Absolutely never happens, okay? <clears throat> so you can think of like a face detection problem. You have a million images uh, and you find 10 million boxes in those images uh, and you score them by some face detector. And in the best of all possible worlds, the highest scoring boxes would be the true faces. You could say when you get to this level, this point in the sorted list, you could throw everything else out. Positive rate and a zero percent false positive rate. That never happens. Right? When you want to get that last face in, you're going to pay a hefty price with your false positives. And that's what you see here. Right? <clears throat> if you want to operate at a even a 20% false positive rate, right? Uh, if, you want, if you want to be at a 90% true positive rate, you're going to absorb 20% of the false positive rate. Okay? <clears throat> so this is the so-called receiver operating characteristic curve. And computer vision papers are full of these things. Okay? <clears throat> and in order to get a computer vision paper published, you have to apply your algorithm to one of the standard data sets. It's highly competitive, and your curve's got to be higher. Okay? That is, you have to perform better on some challenging data set than anybody in the world uh, at the time that you write your paper. Is this easy? No, because there are literally tens of thousands of people now working in computer vision. Did any of you see the article in the New York Times about the salary being, salaries being paid to high-level AI, which really means deep learning, people in industry? Did you see this? No, you don't read the Times, right? When I was a kid, it was a long time ago, uh, in junior high school in, in Brooklyn, Everybody was required, the New York Times gave every kid in New York a free subscription to the Times, okay? And you had to read it every day, because the first thing that happened when you came into school is you got quizzed on all the first front page articles of the New York Times. So I got used to reading the New York Times. Anyway, uh, a few days ago there was an article published and it revealed the salaries of the high-end scientists working at a place called OpenAI. Right. OpenAI is this think tank funded by Elon Musk and a few other people. Uh, and so 
Uh, one of these salaries was quoted for a guy named Ian Goodfellow. He's the person who invented these things called GANs. Right? Last year he made $850,000 uh, working at, at a research center. Okay, <clears throat> uh, And then uh, there was this uh, kid from Stanford who got his PhD from Stanford uh, and he was making over a million dollars. He's out two years all right, in salary. So <clears throat> it might not be a bad idea to get really good at deep learning all right, uh, because there's some chronic shortage of skilled people in the world right, right now who can do this stuff. All right, okay, so now you know how to read ROC curves, okay? All right, so <clears throat> let's talk about this core 3D project a little bit. So this is the project where you want to build three-dimensional models of all the man-made structures like buildings, bridges, whatever, elevated roads in the world from satellite images, right? And I said you have many, many passes of the satellite, but we're just going to look at one at a time, right? And the first problem I'm going to look at is the problem of image completion, okay? And so image completion is the problem of filling in a hole in a picture. Okay, so you have a picture and there's some missing data, okay? Uh, so why, when would this occur in, in everyday life? Well, it occurs with me all the time because I'm really kind of clumsy with my iPhone, right? And I take a picture, maybe my grandson or something, finger in the frame, right? And it's a really good picture and I have three choices. I can throw the damn picture out, I can leave it as is, or I can go to Photoshop and eliminate my finger, okay? <clears throat> Draw a little... Uh, region around the area I want fixed and Photoshop will fix it. How? All right? How does that happen? All right? What happens in, in our core 3D problem, there's no missing data, but we want to build three-dimensional models of buildings and buildings are often overhung by vegetation, by trees. Right? But we need the complete three-dimensional model. We can't be satisfied with just the piece of the building that we see that isn't in, in canopy cover. All right, so that's the problem, okay? Uh, <clears throat> occlusions to the building principally by vegetation uh, make it hard to do what's called material classification, what's the roof made out of, uh, and then also do the 3D reconstruction. So we want to remove them and create plausible estimates of the hidden structure, okay? <clears throat> and so I'll tell you how Adobe does it because a couple of my students have interned at Adobe over the last four or five years working on their uh, hole filling system. Uh, and then I'll tell you about uh, some of the research that, w that we're doing, okay? So the, the two methods, one is called a patch base method where <clears throat> the way that you fill in the hole is you copy pieces of the image and fill in the hole with other parts of the same image. Okay? And this is based on some assumption about the world being self-similar. You know what a fractal is? Okay? So it's sort of like at a high level assuming that things are kind of fractal and anything that you don't see here really just Comes, it's a copy of something else that you've, that you've seen, okay? <clears throat> and so I'll tell you about this sort of multi-scale algorithm, it's called patch match, uh, that fills in a hole uh, at successively higher and higher resolution versions of the hole by copying pieces of the image that's seen, okay? Uh, and then I'll tell you about deep models, okay? About autoencoders, did you talk about autoencoders? Yeah. Okay, about the use of an autoencoder, uh, and then I'll just show you a uh, adversarial network and see if it works. Okay? Okay, so in painting, so called patch based methods. <clears throat> All right? So here's how these generally work. Okay? At the first step, you take your input image, and here's the hole. We want to fill this in, right? We don't know what's underneath there, because we really do, otherwise, we couldn't evaluate it, but in the real world, we wouldn't. Uh, and we build what's called an image pyramid. Like an image pyramid, you just take the image, and replace it by a smaller version of the image by averaging all the non-overlapping two by two neighborhoods, right? So if the original image is 512 by 512, the next level of the pyramid is what size? Anybody? Non-overlapping two by two, so you're gonna reduce the resolution by two in each direction, 256 by 256, okay? If you do it again, it becomes, now it's easy, right? You see the pattern. What does it become? Sorry, what? You go from 512 by 512 to 256 by 256, what's the next size? 128 by 128, and the pattern continues, say, but probably not past 64 by 64. And it's called a pyramid because if you put one on top of the other, they get smaller and smaller, they taper like a pyramid, okay? So each level in the pyramid is a reduced resolution representation of below it, or a higher resolution representation of what's directly above it. So details are lost as you move up through the pyramid, okay? <clears throat> and so the algorithm works uh, starting at the top of the pyramid, trying to fill in what's now a pretty small hole, because the hole gets smaller too, and then working its way down the pyramid, right, using the solution at the level above to initialize uh, the solution at the next level. 
right? This is what Adobe actually does, okay? <clears throat> so you fill in the hole at the coarsest scale just by some smooth interpolation from the outside, right? Like something called bilinear interpolation, all right? Some simple thing that says, well, here's a pixel in the hole. Let's just give it a weighted average of all the pixels on the perimeter of the hole weighted by their distance from this pixel. Because if you're right in the very center of the hole, you'll take a uniform average of all the pixels surrounding you. If you're up near the corner, you'll give a lot more weight to the pixels at, at border the corner of the hole. Right? So you just come up with some initial estimate of the pattern in the very low resolution hole. Now you step up in resolution, move down the pyramid to the next finer scale, and you now look for and you take the patch, you're trying, you take the hole you're trying to fill and you break it up into small pieces. And you start looking for patches around the image that look like those small pieces. Maybe you find the 10 most similar patches all around the image. You average them all together and replace that piece of the hole with that average. Okay, that's why it's called patch match. Okay, you increase the resolution of the image, you do that again. Okay, when it works, it's incredible. All right, not necessarily correct, but incredible. So you could uh, have your finger in front of some branching structure for a tree, and with reasonable frequency, it will put in, it'll fill in the branching structure. It might not be exactly correct, but a visual, unless you look very carefully uh, at the result, you'd be hard pressed to tell that it's really hallucinated, okay? That it was concocted by this algorithm, okay? So this is the Adobe patch match idea, okay? <clears throat> and so that shows it going through its stages, right? We, these are too small to see. I'll show you one blown up, all right? Uh, so here is, and uh, it's, it's really hard to see in this room, the projectors on campus are kind of antediluvian, all right? Uh, so they're not, they're, they're not very good for images, right? But here's the original image, and this is the piece that we're trying to replace, uh, and that's what patch match fills in, okay? So it fills in something with trees. It fills in some reasonable structure. So originally, this is really just blank, and then based on copying uh, in a multi-resolution fashion, pieces of the image that look like some guest version of what this is, you get a reasonable result, right? So and this is what happens in Photoshop. This is how Photoshop works, right? <clears throat> What's hard is making of taking some little patch from this hole, and, and now you want to find uh, the 10 nearest patches in the whole image, well, there's a lot of patches in an image, all right? <clears throat> and so the, you got to have some way of doing that that takes less than linear time in the number of, of, of patches in an image, right? So if you take a uh, computer science course on data structures, you'll learn how to do that, all right? <clears throat> but you can also solve this problem with a deep model, okay? And the simplest way of doing this is simply to train an autoencoder all right, to solve the problem, right? The nice thing about autoencoders is there's generally an infinite amount of free training data, right? This is now the, you know, the big deal in computer vision is you want to be able to solve computer vision problems without going through the time and expense of collecting billions of labeled images, all right? You want to be able to do this with completely unlabeled data, all right? <clears throat> but it's easy to do uh, with this hole filling because you take any image you want, create some random hole in the image, all right, and now the input to the autoencoder is the image with the hole, all right, and the output should look like the original image, all right. So you know what your loss function is going to be. Your loss function is going to be some, did you talk about L2? Can I say that? All right, it's going to be some L2 norm on the original image and the reconstructed image. All right? And of course, that's going to be zero on all the pixels that are not changed, right? And so you're really interested in the L2 norm uh, in and around the vicinity of the hole. So you restrict it to in and around the vicinity of the hole. All right? So you can take millions of images and put millions of random holes in them and train this autoencoder. Right? The autoencoder uh, has these convolutional layers and you downsample them, and then you get to this thing in the middle, which is called the bottleneck layer. In, 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 in deep learning. That's called a bottleneck layer, all right? <clears throat> and sometimes it's also referred to as a latent space representation. Latent because it's not really given to you, you have to discover it, it's sort of implicit in the data, all right? So the autoencoder learns how to decrease the resolution of the image down to this bottleneck and then increase it back up on the other end, all right? <clears throat> and it can learn to do hole filling, okay? Uh, <clears throat> and so that's what this thing does, okay? 
Oh, oh it uses something called, I, I won't bother getting into that, that's too technical. All right, and so this is, in our, in our problem, this is easy to do. We take one of these uh, satellite images, and this is an RGB version of a satellite image. Satellite images have eight channels. They're not like regular visible images, right? There are eight measurement channels per pixel, uh, but it can't see that, so you turn it into a color image. So here's a color image, uh, and we do building detection, right, uh, with some other method, and we start blanking out pieces or pieces of buildings uh, and giving that as input to the autoencoder and then having it learn to fill in the buildings, okay? <clears throat> uh